We'll make a few more points here about, in particular, power conversion efficiency. So in other words, the efficiency at which power plants are converting the primary resource, the fuel, be that a mobile fuel or something like a solar energy resource, into electricity. A good place to start looking at the efficiency of conversion in power stations is to maybe take a step back and look at on a grand scale, on a country scale in this case. This chart is giving the energy flow in the UK electricity system, the UK power system, for the whole of the year 2014. And so the units are very big, it's in terawatt hours. On the left hand side, we've got a whole bunch of sources which you can group as primary energy sources, and they add up to quite a big number. Now you've got to be slightly careful when you look at primary energy as to what is being measured. You'll notice that on this chart there are a group of sources at the bottom and up to nuclear towards the top, which kind of feed into this block marked power station whereas there's a small amount of other primary energy, imported electricity, wind and solar, hydro, for example, which are feeding in at the top and kind of bypassing that block-marked power stations. Those sources at the bottom, plus nuclear, are all thermal power generating sources. So that input into the block-marked power station is actually the thermal input into those power stations. For sources like coal, natural gas, also biomass, we burn those sources. We just set fire to them and we release pretty much all the energy that's in the primary fuel as heat, which we can then put into our power station. But really on this chart, you can regard for those sources, petroleum down to coal, those numbers as being a reasonable proxy for the actual energy content of the fuels going into the power station. Nuclear is slightly different. In that the number here for nuclear again is the thermal input of nuclear into the power station because essentially what we do with nuclear is we use a fission reaction which generates heat from the nuclear pellets the nuclear fuel that goes into the power station now it's worth bearing in mind that that number that heat input is not the same as the energy of the uranium that we dug out of the ground somewhere because with nuclear there's quite a long and complicated process of extracting the uranium, enriching the uranium, and so on. So I'll give in this chart, we're not really capturing the primary energy content of the uranium ore that we've dug out of the ground, that we've mined, in the same way that we are capturing the energy content of a ton of coal that we've mined. We're kind of starting a bit further down the line with the heat that we release into the power conversion process. And then with sources such as hydro, wind, solar and so on, it varies as to how that's treated on a diagram like this. Clearly there's no conversion in terms of heat to electricity. With solar energy we're just converting light solar radiation directly to electricity. With wind we're converting kinetic energy of the wind directly into electricity. Now what these figures don't measure is the total energy resource, the total amount of sunshine or the total amount of wind energy that fell on every solar panel and every wind turbine in the country during that year. So in that sense we're not measuring the primary natural resource. Generally speaking these diagrams either measure simply the electricity that was generated directly or in some cases there's a calculation which makes some assumptions about how much conventional fuel usage, how much conventional primary energy has been substituted by generating electricity with these non-fuel sources. So that's what we're calling the inputs or primary energy into our electricity system. And on the right hand side we've got a list of how that electricity was used by end users. A little bit of it was exported and you'll notice that in the UK exports were less than imports on the left and then you can get a sense for where most of the electricity usage is in terms of domestic versus industrial usage but obviously the big takeaway is the difference between the numbers the amount of primary energy that went in on the left is much much bigger than the 
amount of electricity, electrical energy that was actually used by people to do things on the right. And that brings us to the bit in the middle, this grey bar that's kind of descending down the diagram. And you'll notice that is marked conversion, transmission and distribution losses. In other words, that's energy lost. And the scary thing is that the amount of energy lost from the system is much bigger than the amount of energy that actually was used to do something by end users. Most of those losses are in the efficiency of, by which we can convert heat going into the power station into electricity out. And then there'll be some losses in the power lines between the power stations and the end users. But certainly it's quite a sobering picture in terms of how we use energy overall, the efficiency with which we use energy overall in a power system. There's an awful lot going in on the left in those fuels, particularly in this case coal, natural gas, and a relatively small percentage of that being converted into electricity and ending up powering your television, your lighting, your toaster, whatever it may be. So here's a table of some typical power conversion efficiencies, the efficiency with which power plants are typically converting their inputs into electrical output. The idea of this table is it's not supposed to be a definitive, all-encompassing list. Efficiencies of power plants will vary for a number of reasons. They'll vary depending how old the power plant is, the type of technology it's using, also how it operates. A bit like driving your car, if you drive at a constant speed, you'll use fuel much more efficiently than if you're constantly accelerating and decelerating. Power plants have the same issues in some of their operations. If they're constantly being asked to ramp up and down to meet variation in demand, they'll operate less efficiently than if they can just run at a nice constant rate. But these figures should give you some general idea. The ones in red are those thermal sources, so essentially producing heat from the fuel, which is then converted into electricity. And so those numbers are those conversion numbers for heat to electricity. And so again, bear in mind that the main one to look out for there is, is nuclear, where we're measuring the efficiency of the conversion of the heat released from the fission reaction into electricity. But bear in mind that the amount of heat released in the fission reaction is quite a different number from the energy content of the primary uranium ore that we mined in the first place, because there's a whole enrichment process that's gone on to turn that into pellets. With thermal power generation, another variable which will alter the efficiency of conversion is the temperature of the input. The temperature with which either the fuel burns, or in the case of something like geothermal, the temperature of the water that you extract from the ground. If you start with a lower temperature, then your conversion of heat to electricity will be less efficient. That's why geothermal looks quite low on this chart, because some sources of geothermal have relatively low temperatures and so the conversion of that heat from the water into electricity is also relatively low. But of course with geothermal you've not had to buy the fuel. With things like oil and biopower again it can depend on the technology that's being used. Some plants might be very large using conventional steam or in the case of oil sometimes gas turbine generation. Equally you could have small generator sets using internal combustion engines at lower efficiency. So technology scale, there's a whole bunch of factors that play into what the power conversion efficiency actually is. With things like wind power, the number here really is the maximum theoretical efficiency with which a turbine will convert the kinetic energy of the wind into electrical output. And that will only happen for any turbine at a particular wind speed. So in practice, the conversion efficiency will be much lower than that. With solar PV, conventional solar panels, typical ones anywhere between 10 and 20% efficiency. Although you can get some very specialised ones for use on satellites, for example, or in some forms of what we call concentrated solar PV, which can have much higher efficiencies, but they're not the conventional solar panels that we think about. 
So for solar PV, the main determinant of efficiency is the technology, is the type of solar PV material that you use. But there are also some operational effects. Solar panels, when they get hot, which they do in operation, the efficiency tends to drop. So ironically, if you've got a solar panel sitting out on a hot, sunny day in the desert, it will probably operate at a lower efficiency than one on a cold, gloomy day somewhere else. Of course, that's not to say that the one in the hot, sunny desert won't produce more electricity because the amount of energy arriving in the first place will be vastly higher than the one in the cold gloomy place. So again that's an important point. Efficiency is only telling us something about how much of the primary input we're converting to an output. You can have lower efficiency but if you've got a much higher input in the first place you might still end up with a higher output. And at the top of the chart Hydro turbines these days are incredibly efficient, really, in how they convert the kinetic energy of water into electricity from the generator. Equally, for batteries, we can think about efficiency, and what we mean here is the kind of round trip. So of the electricity that you put in to charge the battery, how much of it do you get out when you discharge the battery? And with modern lithium-ion batteries these days, we're talking about efficiencies of 85-90%, and I've heard claims of higher numbers than that as well. So this table is just giving a typical range of the efficiency with which we can convert the input to our power conversion process to electricity out. So in other words, those numbers are all examples of this. We're looking at the electricity we get out in relation to the energy content of the primary fuel that we put in. So if I represent that visually, we've got a primary fuel and we convert into a certain amount of electricity. And I think, for example, if you looked at the average efficiency of all the power plants in Europe, it comes out at around about 40%. Which means that of that primary fuel, if we're talking about predominantly thermal power generation, the rest of that primary fuel energy is staying as thermal, is staying as heat. And that's why this idea of combined heat and power, CHP, is potentially so important, particularly as primary fuel resources become more expensive or we worry about them being scarce. The idea of wasting 60% of them as heat doesn't seem very wise. All we're doing with CHP, therefore, is instead of regarding it as waste heat, we're trying to use most of that as useful heat. So we have a facility where, as well as putting electricity into the grid, it can also provide heat into a district heating system, for example. And in the very best examples of CHP, where you've got enough market for the heat that you're producing, the leftover waste can actually be quite a small proportion. And so now that looks like a much more efficient system because 90% of the energy of the fuel that we put in we're now using for something. Sticking with electricity, power conversion, we can broadly split power generation into two types. We've got fueled power sources, where the fuel costs money, gas, coal, oil, whatever it may be. Which then means low efficiency is wasting money. You're burning expensive fuel and only a low percentage of it is being converted to something that you can sell. On the other hand, we've got resources which are free. We have to spend money to build a power plant to collect the fuel, but the fuel itself is not something we're paying for. So in that sense, the penalty of low efficiency is that of the resource we've collected, we're failing to use a lot of it. So if we're buying fuel and we have low efficiency but need to generate a certain amount of electricity, we have to buy more fuel. So we have to spend more year after year on fuel. That's an extra operational cost. And obviously if you're putting more fuel into it, your power station itself needs to be bigger. So you'll also have a higher capital expenditure, higher capex. Unless of course your low efficiency power station is so much cheaper to build than your high efficiency power station that building the extra capacity doesn't cost any more money.
If the fuel is free, then for low efficiency, if we want to generate the same amount of energy, we're going to have to collect more fuel. We're going to have to build more solar panels or bigger wind turbines. So that's entirely capital expenditure. There's no extra operational expenditure because we're not buying fuel. So in both cases, obviously, low efficiency has financial economic consequences, but it's worth bearing in mind that they are subtly different. In that if fuel costs money, it's not just potentially an upfront cost that is bigger, but you'll also have an ongoing operational cost that will be bigger. And if you find that fuel gets progressively more expensive in future, then your operational cost will get progressively more and more expensive in future as well. At least in the situation where the fuel is free, your extra capital costs are known because you're spending them today to build more solar panels or more wind turbines. You don't also have an increased future price risk on a fuel that you're burning less efficiently. And then finally with efficiency, an issue that often people get confused with is how it relates to capacity factor, which we've talked about before. So if we start with efficiency, this is basically what we've been saying. We've been saying that the energy resource is converted at a certain efficiency into an electricity output. Instead of talking about energy, I can talk about a rate of energy, in which case if I put energy into my power plant at a certain rate, then it will come out at a different rate, depending how efficiently it's been converted. We're simply dividing energy on each side by time. Which equally means I can then think about the maximum rate at which I can put energy into my power plant, which will give me the maximum rate at which it comes out of the power plant, the maximum power output. And we've talked about maximum power output before, we called it the rated capacity, and it's that number that goes into our capacity factor relationship. Our capacity factor was the energy being generated over a period of time divided by the maximum power output of our power plant multiplied by the time period we're talking about. In other words, conversion efficiency has already been taken into account when we're defining our capacity. So if I generate the same amount of energy from two solar farms, which are both 100 megawatts capacity, the capacity factor of both solar farms will be exactly the same. One of those solar farms might have lower efficiency than the other one. They're both 100 megawatts capacity. If one has lower efficiency, what that means is that the energy coming in to produce that 100 megawatts has to be larger. In other words, you need more panels to do it. So both of our 100 megawatt solar farms will have exactly the same capacity factor, but by virtue of being less efficient, one will occupy a bigger land area. It will need to collect more solar power to produce the same electrical power. So just to sum that up, we said this previously, that in power generation, primary energy is always bigger than the delivered energy, the energy that we use in our devices. And we saw from the UK example that the difference between the two is not minor, it can be huge. And if we think about it in business and economic terms, to be able to generate the same amount of electricity from two different power plants, if you have one with higher efficiency, that can mean one of two things. If we're talking about power plants where you have to buy fuel to operate them, it means that if you've got higher efficiency in one, you'll need to buy less fuel on an ongoing basis for that power plant. That means not only lower operating costs based on a current fuel price, it also means you're reducing your future cost risk if you think fuel prices might escalate. If we're talking about something like a solar farm or a wind farm where you don't have to buy fuel, there's no forward primary energy cost risk. But if you have higher efficiency, it just means you have to collect less of the natural resource to produce the same output. So you need to build less capacity. You need less turbines, less solar panels, whatever it may be. Okay, thank you.